All right, everybody. This is the video I said I would make uh, about this Singer 301. This is a 1952 Singer 301. Uh, I have gone over the whole thing and cleaned it as, as best as I'm willing to do. Uh, usually when I clean machines, what I'll do is I'll take a nylon scrub brush that you would find in like a gunsmithing kit and I'll use kerosene to soak all of the, the moving parts or areas that have lots of varnished oil and I'll just scrub them vigorously with the brush and that does a pretty good job of cleaning up all of the pivot points and all of the uh, shafts and, and uh, gears. This one does have two gears in the top here and it has two gears in the bottom. Those gears need grease. Um, it's not like an oiled gear machine like a 201 is uh, that does, does need grease. So I scraped off the old grease and put new grease on it. For the potted motor, uh, I didn't have to do any rewiring, which is really nice. All I had to do was clean off the gear on the hand wheel and then clean off the gear on the motor. Uh, I took the motor out, obviously, because you can't reach everything from inside the machine. I took the motor out and I used a motor oil, like two drops of motor oil to kind of rejuvenate the sealed bearing on the top of the, next to where the shaft is, where the worm gear is. Uh, and then I used kerosene also to scrub off the old grease on the worm gear itself. And then I used um, Q-tips with rubbing alcohol to kind of clean up the commutator bar. Now some people like to use sandpaper to make the copper on the commutator bar uh, as shiny as a penny. I don't really like to do that because you know you're you're losing a lot of copper when you have to polish things like that. So it doesn't need to be shiny like a penny, it just needs to be clean. So I just cleaned it with a Q-tip and some rubbing alcohol and uh, then I applied the grease to the worm gear. Well, I put it into the machine first. I applied the grease to the worm gear. I applied a little bit of grease to the hand wheel gear that it, that it uh, meshes with. Uh, greased the two gears at the top, greased the gears at the bottom. And then I just went through uh, the oil points with regular sewing machine oil. And uh, it's been working very well. Uh, I haven't done a lot of actual projects with it. I've just been kind of sewing on scrap fabric like I have today. But um, it's a wonderful machine. It is an aluminum bodied machine. It's not like the old uh, cast iron machines. But the advantage to that is that you can reach nearly every piece of the machine without having to take it off of the machine, which is a very nice feature because it allows you to clean the machine thoroughly or nearly thoroughly without risking damage to old screws or uh, delicate parts like that. So you can take off the top of the machine and you can see the entire shaft, which is uh, very nice. You can obviously open the faceplate and you can see all of the pivot points inside. And uh, there's a grease or there's a, a drip tray, I should say, on the bottom of the machine that you can take off and you can see all of the underneath the cantilever, uh, you know, ca cantilever shafts, the, the pitman arms, all of the, all of the pieces that make the sewing machine function. Uh, you can reach that stuff pretty easily. So that's that's uh, really easy to clean and very quick to service. Um, the bobbin case is very similar to a, it's the same bobbin case that you would find in like a featherweight in which I don't, I don't have a featherweight, but uh, the case is the same. The cases are rather expensive. So it's important if you're buying an old, old 301 like this to make sure that the case is actually in the machine or to make sure that you're able to negotiate the price if it's not because these cases are, uh, if you are interested in getting a Singer made bobbin case, you're looking at spending you know, upwards of 70 or $100. Um, they obviously make like $30 Qtex off-brand uh, cases Sometimes I've heard that the, the quality is not nearly as reliable on the third-party cases, but uh, I don't I don't know. I only have the Singer case that it came with, so I can't really comment on that. But it is something to consider if you're interested in buying one of these machines. Just 
get the case or make sure that you're able to get a discount on the price if it doesn't have the case because you will have to spend some money after it in order to get either a third party or a singer case. Um, that's about it for the machine. Uh, as I said, it's an aluminum machine, so the, the body is aluminum, I should say. All of the inside pieces are either chrome steel or stainless steel or, or just regular steel. Um, it's, a, it's a very durable machine. It's not going to fall apart or, you know, the gears are not going to strip themselves. There's not going to be any catastrophic problem that you can't resolve yourself at your own house for the most part. Sometimes I suppose it's possible to damage it in a way that you'd have to get, get new parts or call somebody that knows a little bit more about this machine than you do. Uh, but I didn't run into any issues with this machine and I can't imagine a scenario where you would have to replace like metal gears or you'd have to replace the shaft or you would damage something. The only weak points this machine would have is the same weak points that any other industrial machine or a vintage machine would have is a, the hook obviously could be damaged. The hook is what obviously catches the needle thread and wraps it around the bobbin case in order to create the stitch. So the hook could be dulled or damaged. Um, it is possible, I suppose, to get a case stuck inside the machine that you would have to break the case in order to extract it or you would have to uh, unbolt a bunch of other stuff in order to take it off. Um, I didn't have to do any hook timing or anything like that with this machine, so I can't comment on how difficult or, or easy it is. I know that I've had to time hooks on 201s and, and 1591s, and it's, it takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of reading through a Singer adjust, Adjuster Manual or a YouTube video, but uh, it's not too difficult. This one does have a light that I'm going to turn off for the video so it doesn't get uh, a lot of glare on my fingers, but uh, let's get into the sewing. So what I've got is a piece of, it's cotton, they call it a cotton denim, but it's more like a canvas to be honest with you. But I've got two layers of it. I've got a uh, 116 size needle here. I've got black thread on the top and we've got white thread coming out of the bobbin. So we'll be able to see the stitches pretty nicely. And I'm going to stitch it along this corner as if I was doing a top stitch on a headband. So usually what I'll do is I will move myself closer to the machine. Oh, whoops. This cabinet's got a little drawer that extends below the lever, so you have to open the drawer in order to get to the lever in order to use the machine. Anyway, here we are. So, what I like to do is I will set it so the fabric is dead center of the little toe on the right of the, the needle, and that gives me about a eighth of an inch edge stitch around the a headband or if I'm uh, you know doing top stitching around zips or something like that for a case of some kind then that would be what I would aim for. These old vintage machines don't have a lot of uh, torque immediately when you press down the the, the uh, pedal because the motors don't have a lot of torque what you can do if you want to start it slowly I mean you can start at a regular speed if you want to and it'll just you know, sometimes it'll take off like a rocket. What I like to do is to have a sort of a more controlled start where what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my right hand on the hand wheel and I'm going to move the hand wheel. Um, it is going to spin, what is that, counterclockwise, so it's going to be turning uh, towards me in order to start the machine. As I'm turning the hand wheel, I'm going to be feathering the foot control um, th this particular case, or the particular cabinet that I'm sitting at, the uh, foot controller, the pedal, is mounted inside the case, inside the cabinet, and I'm just going to use a knee bar that actuates the button on the foot control. So even though I'm using a foot pedal, I'm operating with my knee, which is uh, different, but I thought it would be more fun to keep things as, as authentic as possible for this particular machine, so I didn't use my usual electronic pedal. So what I'm going to do is first of all I'll start off with just my knee lift or my, my knee um, accessory 
and I'm not going to touch the hand wheel and hopefully you'll see what I mean when I say that it doesn't have a lot of starting gusto until you actually press down on it. So that's that's not too bad actually. That's that's uh, starting pretty controlled. Uh, sometimes if you start it up, it'll feel like there's a sort of a a sticky point where in order to overcome the uh, motor's resistance to movement, you have to really stamp on it, or in this case, you really have to hit it with your knee uh, in order for it to actually get any kind of activity. But uh, that was a pretty good start, so not a big deal. Um, what I'm going to show next is I'm going to show how I would use my hand to kind of give it a bit of a push start in order so it will start slowly uh, and be a lot more controlled when it gets going. It's not going to get super fast, hopefully. So we'll see if I can do that. Um, I'm not super good with this machine yet since I've only had it for a little bit and I've used it even less. So let's try it. So now it's going and it's pretty slow. Anyway, so let me show you what the tension looks like. I didn't actually have to do a lot to do it to modify the tension. On this fabric, the bobbin looks great. There's no black thread that I can see on the bobbin side. But when I turn it over on this fabric, I can see uh, little white spots that tells me that the needle thread is too tight and it's pulling the bobbin up higher than it should. It should be about halfway. With just two layers, it's a little bit more difficult to get a perfect tension because there's only two layers, so there's only a very thin margin where the knot, the, the, the link between the, the top and the bottom thread should be. So I'm going to try to loosen it just a little bit and see whether we can get something that's a little bit better. So I still see a couple of spots, but a lot fewer comparing the uh, first stitch line with the second stitch line. And I'll, at the end, I'll, I'll put the, the lights on this a little bit better so you can see it, but uh, you'll just have to take my word for it for right now. So I'm just going to go a little bit looser still, and hopefully that will do it. You can feather it a little bit and it can get pretty slow. So if you're doing like uh, over a hump or you're doing an area where there's a very, very little margin for error on the stitch, then you can go pretty slow, but it's just difficult to start slow. So it has no problem getting slow when you're moving. And that looks a lot better. So. There's still a couple of spots where I can see the bobbin thread from the top, but that also could be the fact that it's only two layers and it's very thin fabric, so it's not likely to get every single piece evenly. I might just try one more time for the heck of it, but it's probably not going to fix everything. It's just the way it is. And this is not anywhere near the top speed of this motor. Um, I just, I don't know, I like to sew slowly because I like to feel a little bit more control from the machine and I don't want it to run away from me. You know, nobody likes to screw up, a, you know, if you're sewing on a label and you go too fast, it can kind of jump off. So that looks a lot better. So I don't see any spots. Uh, off the top of my head that look like they would need some more adjustment. The tension looks, looks pretty good.
you know, there's a certain point where at you, you'd want to take out the boppin case and loosen that, but I don't actually want to get to that for this video just because um, that's, that's going to be a very boring video. So tension looks good enough. Um, that's pretty much it. Obviously there is a bobbin winder right here, so you would just, uh, instead of threading it through all of these things, you would thread it through this back one, this one here, and then I'm assuming that and I haven't looked at the manual yet much, so I'm assuming that the thread would, path would go through this back guide, then this one here, and then from there it would go down here, or you could just put a spool right here and thread it through the uh, bobbin winder tension assembly right here at the bottom. I'm not sure if you can even see this in the video. Yeah, you can see this in the video. Um, loop it underneath, go up through here, and then you would put the bobbin on the spindle, thread the, the uh, thread through it, and then you would raise it so this rubber tire is touching against the hand wheel, and then you'll disengage the clutch on the machine. And now, no needle movement, but the bobbin winder is working perfectly. So that is, a very reliable design. There's not a whole lot that can go wrong with it. Sometimes varnished oil can make the winder difficult to spin. Uh, in that case, you know, you could just dribble in some kerosene in through that hole and let it set for a little while, or you could use liquid wrench, pea blaster, whatever you'd like to use. Um, obviously, for these machines, there's not a whole lot of situations where WD-40 would be useful, because WD-40 is not a lubricant. It's just a it's good for displacing water, but it's not much good for actually lubricating moving metal parts. So that's about it. Um, it's been a great machine so far. I'm looking really, I'm really looking forward to using it a lot to actually make headbands and not just, uh, you know, stitching on scrap pieces of fabric. But I just wanted to show you guys what this particular vintage is all about and maybe give you a little bit of information about vintage machines in general. Um, they're wonderfully inexpensive. You can get a lot of them on Facebook Marketplace or thrift stores or estate sales. And typically when grandma is finished sewing on her machine, she'll just put it in the basement and it's not necessarily going to be broken. It just needs some cleaning. So you might need to buy some kerosene or some, some uh, sewing oil some brushes maybe, uh, just to really give it a good clean and then to make sure that all the parts are moving smoothly. Uh, and then you just follow the manual for servicing, you know, and if, if you find the, the, if you get the machine with the manual, that's great. If you can't find a manual, then just look online. Uh, Google is your friend. And then before you know it, you've bought a machine that will outlast you and your children for just a couple hundred dollars. So. Great machines out there, plenty to be had by everybody, and um, I recommend it. So, almost forgot to show you the stitches. It's pretty bright, but you should be able to see this is the needle side. So you can see that there's uh, white spots, which means that the bobbin thread is getting pulled up too high. And then as we move down to this third, this third line, it's a little bit better. There's still a couple of spots there. Fourth line is pretty much perfect. Uh, there are a couple of spots at the beginning of the stitch. And um, there's like a spot there. But all in all, it looks pretty good. And then the bottom, that's about as picture perfect as Singer can get. So. Very happy with this machine so far and uh, look forward to using it.